Um, I just want to really thank the Renaud family, and uh, yeah, because they really helped me through all this, you know, with doing Facebook Live and everything. And uh, so it was a blessing. Thank you guys. And uh, and also, you know, Wendell came and preached. You know, I appreciate that. So it was just been been a blessing. And uh, we have with us this morning uh, Mike and Lori Snook. They uh, they have been uh, missionaries to Vietnam and um, a place that I've been familiar with. <laughs> Uh, and and so they went over there and started a school. If you all remember, we helped them, you know, at the beginning of their missionary trip and everything. And so they're in town. Um, and so I, I said, hey, you got to just give us a testimony of what God's been doing. Because I've been watching them on Facebook, you know, and they're here and there and, you know, and everywhere. And so it's, it's a blessing to have them with us this morning. So let's welcome Mike and Lori. They're going to kind of share what's going on. Hope Church. Thank you, Travis, for that beautiful worship music. I'll tell you what, being in a church and worshiping God with a band up front is different than anything I've done for the last several months. I'll tell you what, it's so special being back with our family, Hope Church. Thank you, thank you, Pastor Joe, for inviting us to say a few words. You know, it seems like every time we come to this church, though, we leave with some trouble. Because God sends us in all kinds of strange directions from here. We may go home for a little while, but then he ends up sending us somewhere else in the world. And uh, Lori and I want to share just a couple minutes with you about Vietnam. We went back to Vietnam in September of last year. We've been doing mission trips over there for the last five or six years. But we went back this time to start a school, a Christian school. And we ended up being there three and a half months in country, which is a long time. We usually go for one or two weeks. So, but, uh, but the Lord said, we're calling you to go back to Vietnam. I was there in the 60s too, just like Pastor Joe was. And uh, we've been back many times, but this trip was really special. I want Lori to share a little bit about that, unless you want to watch the video first. If you could just put up the PowerPoint. I don't want to take too much time because we really want to hear Pastor Joe preach too. But I just want to show you, you helped us get this school started. We left here in January and Pastor Joe showed us the ACE school that you just moved into the building. And uh, these are uh, our students. So it's a real short, we're, it's an English speaking school, but um, they didn't know English. And so... Um, Anyway, it's been a real, the hardest an assignment that God sent us on yet, but we also got to teach them Jesus. And uh, so this is our kids performing, and uh, we wanted to share you a short song today.
it was, it was really special to um, be over there, and um, we were the first Christian school we found out in Saigon that it opened. And um, we met with many other teachers in the country that were teaching at international schools, and they all told us, you can't open a Christian school. But God had opened the door, and it was through teaching English language. And, um, and we had an hour of culture every day, and every morning we started with devotion, like the singing and dancing with the kids. And, uh, and so anyway, um, you guys were a big part of that, so thank you so much. And just a few pictures we just want to show you um, of the school. This is, um, they called us the pioneers. The, the teachers are mainly American, Caucasians, They're, but we have teacher assistants to help with the language barrier. Uh, this is my class. It was the little kids. This is a school, and uh, we didn't have very many students starting out, and that was perfect for us because we weren't teachers, so this was all new. God just sent us out. Uh, we'd never been missionaries before, so uh, I guess God knows what we're able to accomplish for him. So we had three classrooms, but anyway, the school's still going in Vietnam. They're teaching online right now. We have new teachers, younger teachers over there, and um, and it's um, we plan on opening two more schools um, come uh, this fall. So anyway, God is blessing it, and uh, I know God will continue to bless Hope Church. You've been a really big part of that, and our saying that we've had all along with the ministry, what we felt was on our heart is if we can uh, change a child, we can change a generation. And if we can change a generation, then we can change a country for Jesus. But I'll tell you what, none of this would have been possible without having this church pushing us and supporting us since 2015. We, I don't know how we get here every year. We, we didn't come down to be at the church this time. We were down for a totally different reason. And Pastor Joe said, why don't you come over and tell us what you've been doing. And, and so we just feel really blessed to be here. And especially on the first day back. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Thank you, Pastor Joe. So that, that is a tremendous miracle for a Christian school to be in Vietnam. I mean, it's uh, just really a blessing. And you said your culture classes was? King James culture classes. King James culture <laughs> <laughs> That's also. <laughs> and uh, Mike also wrote a book uh, on his uh, testimony about being in Vietnam and how God used him and saved him so he could tell you more about that if you're interested in that so well it's it's good to be back I think I jumped the gun on this I think we were supposed to wait until next week but <laughs> as long as I don't get arrested before the church is over we're all right <laughs> oh, the mayor's here <laughs> The mayor will bail me out, I hope. <laughs> oh, Lord. You know, uh, we went into this thing and, and never been through something like this before. And as far as I could remember, you know, and I've been around for a few years. But, uh, you know, it, it, it just, uh, it's now... It, it, it's about how we come out of this, you know, is what is important. And, and the, I just got a short message this morning I want to share with you. It's called turning the test into a testimony, because it's always it's it's been a test for all of us, you know. Uh, I think we could say that, you know, this pandemic has uh, tested our finances, 
and uh, it's a test of our patience, especially for moms who are home with little kids locked in a house. <laughs> There's one over there saying, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> and uh, I, I know my daughter has to work at home, and she's got two little kids, you know. And, and so uh, what she got him to do was call Grandma. <laughs> So I think she was on the phone with Mila for, like, I know, at least three hours, <laughs> keeping her busy. And then I saw, you know, uh, this uh, thing on Facebook where this lady was typing out, working on her computer, and, and you look over, and the kids had duct tape on their mouth. <laughs> so, you know, it has been kind of a, a test of our, our finances, our patience, and also our freedoms, you know. Because we're not used to being, you know, hey, you got to stay home. You know, we're used to doing whatever we want to do when we want to do it. So, but most of all, I think it's been a test of our faith, really. Uh, it really has tested our faith. And when all this is over, will we have a stronger faith or a greater fear? When, when all this is over, will we have a stronger faith or a greater fear? And... Uh, God can use this uh, to cause us to grow spiritually and to strengthen our faith. I heard a politician say, never waste a good crisis. And uh, so they use uh, these crises to, to move their political agenda forward. And how many have heard politicians say that before? You know, so, but God can use this for your good, God can use this for your good and for his glory. And uh, the scripture I could back that up with is Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, how many love God in here this morning? Amen. Amen. Just about everybody in here, praise God. I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> Right message, right place. <laughs> and we know that for those who love God, listen to this. This scripture really has blown up in my face. I mean, it just really came alive. For we know that all those who love God, all things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's for those who are called according to his purpose. There's a different kind of outcome for those who don't love God and trust God when going through stuff than those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If you love God and desire to live out God's plan and will for your life, it's going to work for your good. First Peter, in 1 Peter 6, 7, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. See, it's just a little while. I heard Mother Teresa once said that all the suffering in this world can't compare to the glory that God has in store for us. He said it's, she said it's just like a, a one bad night in a hotel compared to what God has for us. It says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, it's, it's a test of the genuineness of our faith. You know, we could talk about faith, we could preach about faith, but is your faith genuine? So... The, the tests bring out the genuineness of our faith. I heard a story about this uh, tightrope walker, and he had a, had a, a rope, a, a wire across the Grand Canyon, and he was going to push a wheelbarrow across the Grand Canyon, walking on this tightrope. And this young guy over there, he's saying, yeah, go, Billy, I know you could do this. You're the greatest. And, and so the tightrope walker said, you really believe I could do this? And he said, yeah, man, I've seen you do so many awesome things. You're great. I know you could do this. And he said, well, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> and 
so we preach faith, we get excited about faith, we sing songs about faith, but are you in the wheelbarrow? So that it's a test of the genuineness of our faith. And it's, it's more precious than gold, though it be tried by fire. And, and the result of the test of the genuineness of your faith, that's why I say things work out different for those who love God when they're going through stuff than those that don't because it works something in you and out of you. <clears throat> it's, it's more precious than gold, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So... When you go through these things, God is creating character in you. He's strengthening your faith. And, and people wonder, why do you have peace in the midst of all this thing? And why aren't you worried? Why don't you have all kinds of anxiety? Because God is, is, is strengthening my faith. And, and that's why I could have peace in the midst of a storm. And it, and it works out glory and honor to God because people see Jesus in you. It, Jesus is being revealed in you in the midst of all this. Our faith isn't tested because, because God doesn't know how much or what kind of faith we have. It's tested because we often are ignorant on how much or what kind of faith we really have. God's purpose in testing is to display the enduring quality of our faith. Testing the genuineness of our faith. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, there's a story about a man named Joseph. And as a young boy, Joseph father just favored him. He, he was kind of the favorite, you know. And he had this coat of many colors and all of his brothers were jealous about his father favoring him. And so <clears throat> one day Joseph has this dream about how all his brothers one day were going to bow down to him. And so he goes out and tells his, bro his brothers this. And his brothers didn't like it, you know. They, they thought he was just being haughty and proud. You know, some things you just don't have to tell other people about <laughs> when God shows you something. Some things are just kind of, you just hold it in, you know, people think you're nuts. So uh, so he went out and told them, and they got jealous, and, and so, you know, they plotted against him and, and uh, tried to destroy him. They took him out one day, and they threw him in a pit, and, uh, and, and then they sold him to the Ishmaelites, and... Uh, you know, made up this story, told his dad that their dad that a, a wild animal got him. But then uh, Joseph was sold to, the, to Potiphar, and Potiphar used him in his house, and he did great in the house of Potiphar, and Potiphar made him, uh, you know, uh, gave him authority over everything. And then his, his wife one day tries to seduce him and falsely accuse him, and he runs out of there, and she grabs his coat, and uh, Potiphar has him thrown into prison. I mean, no, that's just a bad couple of months. I mean, it's a bad day. You know, this guy's just trying to live right. He, he gets thrown into a pit. God gives him a vision. He gets thrown into a pit. He's sold into slavery and, and then thrown in jail. And so while he was in jail, you know, he did everything he, you know, and, and they he was raised up and and given authority and everything. And then uh, Pharaoh had a dream. And <clears throat> nobody could interpret that dream. And so God gave that interpretation to Joseph. And this is where the testimony comes in. The, the other part was a test. It was a test. I mean, he had all kinds of opportunities to give up and to quit and to be bitter towards God. Lord, why did, why did you give me this vision 
that, that I got so excited about, and then you, I, I get thrown in jail, and then I get sold into slavery, and, and, and then I, I, I wind up in, in, in this prison. Why, why did you do that, God? I thought that I was going to be your servant. I thought that you called me to greatness, and here I am sitting in prison. That was the test. But praise God, the Lord had was going to bring a testimony out of all this test. I mean, Joseph went in there. He interpreted the dream. It was spot on. And, and Pharaoh made him ruler, uh, uh, second in command over all of Egypt. And God raised him up, and he, he saved a whole nation of Egypt from famine and his family. And guess what? His brothers came and bowed down to him. See, there was a test, but it was turned into a testimony. Amen. <clears throat> so how do we turn a test into a testimony? I'm glad you asked that question. Hebrews 6.12 says, So that you may not be lazy, you know, some people have lazy Christianity. They want to be spoon-fed. They want everybody to pump up their faith for them. But here he says, so that you not be lazy, but imitators. Hallelujah, imitators. Have you ever seen your kids imitate you? You know, some, one day I saw this, this, this lady that used to be in our church, and she had a certain walk about her, you know. And one day I was noticing her daughter. She was walking the same way her mom did. <laughs> she was imitating her mom. And the Bible says that we should be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we should imitate people like Moses. We should imitate people like Noah, who went out and, and built an ark because God told him to, and there, it never did rain there. And so he builds this big boat in the field just because God told him to do it. See, we're to be imitators of those people that through faith, through faith and patience, inherited the promises. So the promises are made real and they come into existence through faith and patience. Through faith and patience. James 1.3 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. So, so you don't count it joy for the trial, but you count it all joy because of what the trial is going to produce in you and out of you. So he says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your what? Your faith. See, it's about faith. It's about testing your faith. Produces it. See, your, this test produces steadfastness. Steadfastness. And I want to tell you, I've been saved for many years, and I know one thing that the devil hates is a Christian who is steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in God's work. He hates that. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I know that when I'm steadfast and unmovable that the devil is, is going to quit and give up. Because he knows he's not going to move Pastor Joe. He knows he's not going to move Wendell or Mike or any of us out there because we're being steadfast. I shall not be moved. Jesus is my Savior. I shall not be moved. That was in my message later. Now I really messed up. <laughs> But faith produces steadfastness. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. James 5.11 Behold, we count them blessed 
who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. I think the King James Version says the patience of Job. How he's seen the end of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, he saw the end of the Lord. That doesn't mean God ended. It means that he saw God's plan and purposes fulfilled because he was steadfast and patient. He had people criticizing him. He had people telling him why all this was happening to him and everything, but he was steadfast. I mean, think about that. He lost everything, but he remained steadfast, and he confessed that God's promises will be fulfilled. In other words, you might go into the test with just a little faith, but when you remain steadfast and unmovable in your faith, you'll come out with great faith. The Bible says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, humble yourself. Why do you have to humble yourself? A lot of people don't have God working in their life because they won't humble themselves. They think that they could do it all on their own. They think with all their talents and all their wisdom and, and all their uh, abilities financially, they can handle life on their own. But when you humble yourself before God, that's when God becomes active in your life. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Now listen to this. So that, the reason you humble yourself before God is so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Ooh, I'm about ready to run the aisles. Humble yourself before God that he could, the reason God wants you to humble yourself, not because he, he's mean and 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 doesn't want you to, you know, like yourself, but you humble yourself so God could lift you up. Heard a pre uh, story about a young preacher, and, you know, he, he was all cocky, and boy, it was his first message, and he was going to go up there and just, and just let it rip. <clears throat> he got up in front of the pulpit, and he just start forgetting what he was going to say. He, he, he lost his train of thought, he, and, and he just become, he became humiliated and walked down. Humiliated and humble. And one of the older men of God says, Son, if you would have went up there the way you came down, you would have came down the way you went up there. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting some of your anxieties, all of your anxieties. How many know that this pandemic has been an anxiety for many throughout the world? So casting all your anxieties. And, you know, I looked this up in, the, in a commentary about casting and it talks about you do it with both hands. You just throw it out there. You, you have an anxiety, you just throw it out there to God, casting all your anxieties. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. No, no, that's why he does it. He wants you to do it because he cares for you. God cares for you. And then it says, be sober-minded. And that means to be clear-headed. You know, you can't be clear-headed and really have the mind of God if you're listening to the counsel of the ungodly. If you're listening to the counsel of the ungodly more than you are listening to the Spirit of God and the Word of God, you won't be clear-minded. Be watchful. 
be watchful. You know, when I was in Vietnam, we had watchtowers. We had guard towers. We were right on the beach, and so we had guard towers, you know, every uh, 500 feet. And then you had an M60 up there with you, and so we had to pull guard duty. We had to be watchful because there was somebody trying to get in. They would come in on these sand pans, and they'd try and get into the compound. You know, so we had to be watchful. And, and we had to be watchful because our lives depended on it and other people's lives depended on it. And so what he's saying here is that you be sober-minded, be clear-headed, and be watchful because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking someone who could, he could desire. So he's, he's looking for someone he could fill with fear and unbelief and and he's just trying to find that right moment when you're weak where he could fill you with all kinds of doubt and unbelief and shake your faith. Make no mistake, the main thing that the devil is after in the Christian life is their faith. Because the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. And he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And then it says, resist him, listen to this, firm in your faith. Resist him firm in your faith. Knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. And after you have suffered just a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory See, it's just for a little while. Here, that's the test. Here's what God's going to do. The God who has called you to eternal glory will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Woohoo! That's what comes out of the test. You're going to be restored. You're going to be confirmed. You're going to be strengthened and you're going to be established. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, uh, that your labor is not in vain. The man who wrote that he was five times received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. That doesn't mean he got high on weed. <laughs> he was actually stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. A night and a day was I adrift at the sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, Dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in cities, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights in hungers and thirst without food and cold and exposed. He wrote, therefore, my beloved's, beloved brothers, be steadfast. He wrote that. Even though he was beat five times, left for dead, shipwrecked, put in prison, falsely accused, he still writes, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He wrote most of the New Testament. In other words, just keep showing up. Just keep showing up. Whenever something just keeps showing up, just keep reading your Bible, just keep worshiping God because the, the fulfillment of the promise is, is going to be manifested as long as you're steadfast and unmovable because it's going to produce the manifestation of the thing God has spoken to you. For we are
are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning confidence steadfast unto the end. Then in Psalms 16, 8, it says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Say that with me. I shall not be moved. Have you ever run into a stubborn person? <laughs> Don't shout out any names or nothing. <laughs> but no matter what you do, they're not going to be moved. They're just set in their ways, and they're just not going to do it. And that's the way we need to be with God. You know, I'm just not going to be moved. I'm just going to stand steadfast. So my question to those who follow Jesus is when all this is over, will we have a stronger faith or a greater fear? Will we have a stronger faith or a greater fear? And for those of you out there who don't trust God and are living for, your, for yourself and, and not God's plans for your life, the only hope you have this morning for a good outcome is yourself, the government. That's, that's the only hope you have. I'm going to turn me down. Mike. The only hope, if, if you're not living for God this morning, not called according to his plans if you don't really love God the only hope you have is in the government and in yourself sometimes the government is just not going to be able to help you and sometimes you just run out you come to the end of yourself where you, where you just don't have anything else to work with David said that when my heart is overwhelmed, I may have been overwhelmed before. Aren't you glad that you could go to the rock that's higher than you, that's greater than you? See, as Christians, we, we can go to that rock because we love God, we're called according to his purpose, and things are going to work out for, for the good and for God's glory. But if you don't have the Lord this morning in your life, all you have, you don't have a living hope, you have a dead hope. But you could have a living hope this morning. All you have to do is invite Jesus into your life. He, he, the Bible says that, that in Revelations it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he, he's knocking on, your, on the doorpost of your heart and he wants to come into your life. He wants to show himself strong in your behalf. He wants to reveal that he is real and that he is alive today and all you have to do is open up and say, okay God, I'm humbling myself. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and live in me. He says, I'm knocking at the door of your heart, and if you will open the door, I will come into you and fellowship with you and you with me. See, God created us to, to have fellowship with him. And we're, we're totally not complete in our human form without a relationship with God because he created us to have fellowship with him. You know, we all love to fellowship together. And when we all came in here this morning, everybody was so happy to see everybody, you know, and because God has created us not to, not to live by ourselves, but to, to have fellowship with one another. And when we're separated from that, we really miss it. I mean, we had Bible studies on Zoom, but it wasn't the same as zooming in here this morning <laughs> and, and seeing people you know and uh, but God's created us to have fellowship with him and when you're isolated from that you're separated but God could, could this morning he could cause you to have a relationship with him once again all you have to do is open up your heart we're going to pray right now, and if you would like to have that experience this morning, if you'd like to have God in your life this morning, 
If you're tired of doing life by yourself, I guarantee you this morning, the Bible says if you seek me, you're going to find me. If you would open up your heart to Jesus Christ, he will come into you and make himself known to you. Not not talking about church or religion. I'm talking about a relationship. So if that's you out there this morning, just pray this with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Live in me and live through me. Forgive me of my sins, and I invite you to come in. Even right now, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, I just want to have give you a testimony of, you know, when we came into this thing, uh, I, I kind of had a piece about it. I didn't know why, but, you know, we, we weren't going to have people here. You know, you, you think there's not going to be any offerings. And, but I want to tell you something. This month, our offerings have been greater than last month. Isn't that awesome? And we have fed, during this time, 609 people we've helped with food through this time. Amen. We had eggs to give out and milk when the store didn't have them. And it, and it was just it was just God because this, this church from Perryville called me one day and said, hey, we've got eggs and, and milk. Would you like to have some? And I went over and got them, and, and it's been a blessing. And then Walmart in Perryville has been giving us food every Wednesday, and we've been putting boxes together and having this drive through Tom from Save-A-Lot came over Wednesday, last Wednesday morning, and he said, would you like to have some hams to give away? He gave me five cases of hams, about 38 hams to give away. I, I, was, I was just I was blown away at God's provisions through all this time. So I, I'm coming out of this thing, you know, I, I'm coming out of this thing better than I went in. <laughs> I had a little faith, but now I've seen God's move, his hand and everything, and it, it's, just, uh, it's just been a blessing. So I'm glad to get back and, you know, in the groove of things and, and uh, expecting God to do greater things. So go, you can go ahead. Not only that, we've had uh, in our Facebook Live, we've had almost uh, every week we've had over 400 views. And I've actually had people outside the church sending offerings in to the church because of that. So one lady sent, what was it, $300? $300 for the food pantry. So isn't that awesome? Uh, Mark had the highest views. He had over 600. So I, I contribute that to his big family <laughs> so we are blessed we're blessed I am so blessed for God's faithfulness but also blessed for your obedience uh, and your giving through all this so uh, this is our soft opening so next week we'll just have a hard blessed service <laughs> we'll have children's church next Sunday also amen Lord bless you and uh, continue to distance yourself yes Mary